myself recorded. Okay, so type VirtualBox. And you should see the VirtualBox app like this. Then you are going to click the plus sign to add. And then you are going to navigate to the element E drive. So again, search for VirtualBox on your desktop. And we're finishing up lab one. Okay. If not, we'll, we'll have to change plans because I, I thought I fixed the problem. So once VirtualBox app open, you're going to click the plus sign. Hello. You want to grab one of those gray drives and then turn on your computer and connect it. Okay, so let me see if I can mount it. Find out why it's doing that. Yeah, I copied everything. It cloned it. You guys mm -hmm. getting the same error? Yes. Oh, wasted my two hours already. Uh, yeah, the other one should be working. The older versions is there some but not all the drives have the cis 27 on there okay so if that doesn't work then we'll work on the assignment too i'm a little bit disappointed because <laughs> yeah it's not showing any kind of log file i tested it earlier and it opened for me but because i created it on this machine it might have just go back to the Okay, so you guys are getting the E failed drive error. Okay, everybody, you boot you you you. Some of you got booted. Which file did we open? The Ubuntu. Yeah, so you're gonna go. Okay, so let me fix this. So go VirtualBox, and then you are going to go to Machine, click Add. And then you should see like the clones there. Okay. I have quite a few on there. Some of, I use some for my other classes too. So um, you, when you open the clone, you should see a VBox file and then you click open. I'm getting this error because it's not able to retrieve the. the file that opened. Yeah. Are you, are we getting all the air there? Some of you, so one of you got, okay. You got in? No? Okay, so I'll work on, I'll work on fixing that. I don't know why it's, it's doing that again. But anyway, so let's change plan. <laughs> I'm ready to change plan. So let's work on our unit two. Okay, so let's download the assignment. And then I'll fix those again. Maybe we should use VMware next time. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll work on this and I will try to give you some hands on and we'll do some some stuff as we we would lecture. Okay, um, we will answer some of the questions because these questions are going to come up on your um, security plus certification.
bigger my sound. Okay, I think you should be able to hear me now. Wardo can't come because. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna share screen real quick. <laughs> Too soon. Okay, so we'll come back and do Ubuntu and uh, we'll also play with Windows a little bit so that way we will we will get a little bit more comfortable with the hands-on part. Okay. So in chapter two, chapter two talks about access management. And access management, as I mentioned, is very important. So you need to know what AAA means in, in access management, okay? So that AAA stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. So from the time that the user log in, right, we understand that that's authentication. And once the user log in, their security token from that system. So when you log into the network, your security token is then being passed from your system through the network to the server to really be able to grant the appropriate privileges for you to access the resources on that network. So that's part of authorization when it's granting privileges and permissions and accounting is for us to be able to track what happened to that user what kind of access or what kind of resources they have utilized. So logs is going to be part of the accounting. So to answer the question, we would say that for number one, the AAA means authentication, authorization, and accounting. Okay, and make sure that we know the differences. So how in, in Windows system, how do you really create a login account for someone, right? So at home right now, some of you might log into your computer and some of you might not, right? You would have not require credential, right? Not having to log in. When you turn on the system, the desktop just opens. Is that really safe? Probably not, because if you're sharing that system with someone else, right? That other people can download something that can impact you. Additionally, if you if if something happens to that other user that they're using as your user account, you cannot be accountable for that user. So in a business environment, everyone should have their own login. We do not share accounts, right? Because in the case of fraudulent, you can track that. Okay. In the case of when 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 someone is um, being fired for specific actions, we can track on the system. Okay, hi. Go ahead and take a seat. We just started unit two assignment. So in Windows 10, Windows 11, they modified this a little bit. There are two ways that you can you can you can create user account. Anybody know how? So oh actually you're right. More than two ways. So the interface that to interface on Windows 10, we can create a user account through control panel, right? Most of the time people will go to control panel and control panel allows you to, you know, um, modify the configuration of your system, change settings, and they would click on user account. And then you can click on change user account. Now see how I am on here. This is my laptop, right? And I it shows me as the, the system administrator, okay? I don't have additional user. Now this is gonna be very limited if you're going through control panel, okay? So make sure that we know how to do this when we go to work. When they interview you, they ask you, how do you create a user account on your Windows 10? We can search for control panel, and this is allowing us to control our system resources and settings, right? This is similar, you know, how when you're using settings, it's part of this, right? Before settings, it was control panel, 
and then Microsoft integrated settings to kind of just separate system settings from the overall. Another way that you can control your, your system is through computer management console. So you can also right click your Windows button on the top, on the bottom left, okay? And you should see the computer management console, right? For those of you who took my CS25, you've seen this before. And I tell my students, if you're a Windows administrator, this is your best friend. All right, that's fund number two, right? That's the control panel. So this allows you to be able to control resources as, as well. On the pro, you should also see user accounts on here. So different version of Windows 10, you can see that the resources are changed. So if you're on the if you're on the pro version or the enterprise version, it has more capability. Okay, so you can also manage it this way where you would let me see if I can um, open that up on this desktop here so you can see. Switch real quick. So for those of you who are in the class, you would see that, see, this is a different re edition of Windows 10, and you would see the local users and group, and this is what you see on your desktop as well. So the system administrator can make the user account for that system, right? And then in the case where you have other users that have a little bit less privilege, but they can also create a user account, you can do that. So when you look at the users folder in the computer management console, and I simply right click the Windows button and it would go to computer management. And that would be this console right here. Microsoft calls every Windows that pop up like this console, okay? So you would have users and the groups. And we always practice by adding the user into the group. Your group is a container. You're gonna add that object into the container and you're gonna control the container, okay? And that's the best practice. So you do see some default groups, which came with the OS and you do see some default user. You can customize this by right-clicking the folder and make a new user, or you can also right click the pane and make a new user. And that's how you create a user account, okay? Now let's say that I need to reset a password for a user account, and that's very common for, you know, support technician. I forgot my password, can you, I got locked out on my computer because I forgot my password and I tried it five times. And so can you please reset, right? You simply right click the account and you can choose reset, set password. You give them a generic password, right? But now we have other functionality and we'll talk about the one-time password element, okay? So now you see a little bit on how you can create a user account. We'll do some lab with this, okay? And then if you wanna make a group, you can also create a new group like that. So when we would start with the user account and that's part of identifying who that individual is, okay? So when you make a new user account, it's gonna ask you this, what is the username? Put in the information, right? So in the chapter, it talks about how that process would be, okay? So, for the authentication, we can choose multi-factor. And as some of you know, we're already using this, right? Something you have, which is your smartphone, your email, something you are, which would be your biometrics, your characteristic, your facial recognition. The technology has changed quite a bit. When you're using your ATM machine, right? That's a smart card system, okay? Now, something you know, we often refer to password pin number, right? Or, you know, in the case where sometimes they would ask something specific. But regardless of what type of authentication method you're using, you still should always implement lockout policy. That means that if they're unsuccessfully logging in, we want to make sure that it locks the account. So in security, we're only buying time. Right, we're delaying a little bit so we can investigate. We can look at what's wrong with this particular account. 
okay? So when you implementing authentication, in most system, it would start with at least a password, okay? Now, also having individual account on your computer is great, okay? Because when you started getting into legal manner, let's say that you have two roommates and the one of your roommate committed something, a crime or a criminal activity online, okay? It could be excessively illegal download or infringement of copyright, right? And they're going after this person. So when they have a warrant, they're going to confiscate that system. And what will happen is if you don't have individual account, your data will also be jeopardized, okay? But if you have individual account on that system, you would then see that there would be that they have to have a court order in order to access your profile, which is linked to your file, right? Your logs, all of that information, okay? So when in, in a business environment, when there's a, a legal matter in a, a specific account, there should be a court order process, and then we will be able to pull the data and things like that. Go ahead and okay. So, the the authentication factors you would have something you know such as password pin number something you are biometrics gate etc right so you guys know what gates are gates or gate is your the, the your posture the way you walk okay the way you carry yourself this is being used quite a bit for you know, border patrol, uh, national security, international security. When you enter the airport, the camera zoom in on you and they're tracking your gate already, okay? So now you also have technology to scan your veins and the book talks about that. So in, in addition to palm print, you can lay your, your, your hand onto the scanner and it's going to look at the vein pattern for the palm or the hand, right? Because people can fake fingerprint and people can fake palm print. But when we started getting a little bit deeper into like the characteristic of that person, that subject is then we would see more specific. So in the authentication process, we would then can also use, right? Some, an action, something you do. Okay. Somewhere you are, you can check via GPS, IP addresses, things like that. Okay. And then um, something you can exhibit. And this, you know, you do see government use this quite a bit, right? Facial recognition, but you have to hold up your ID. And then that validates that you are who you are. Okay. So we always want to implement at least two. And you hear in the news lately that it's not always the safest. Nothing is 100%, right? Okay, so these are some of the authentication factor. We make sure that you know the example of them, what they are, how they're used for certifications and for our class. All right. So let's say that we implement password, right? In question three, it says, Mickey receives a one-time password that expires in 60 seconds. So password reset. So when you submit a password reset, company will do this, right? They'll send you an email for, with a temporary password. And they'll tell you on the email that this password is gonna expire in this many minutes. Five minutes, 60 seconds. An hour, right? So in the configuration on the server, we can set that. We can set that when the user submit for password reset, it's gonna automatically randomly generate a string of value, just like how you're getting that text message type for that password. We're working on unit two assignment. So this is what's called a, a time-based one-time password. 
It is different than OTP because it is time-based. So when you're giving a temporary password that you put a time on it, like five minutes and then it expires, it becomes a time-based, one-time password. And what they do is they use a, it uses a random algorithm to be able to generate that one-time password for the user so it doesn't get repeated. Okay. Now, with that, we can validate one of the factors that something they have, right? It could be that we can send them a text message. So they have to have that smartphone that's tied to their phone number or an email, right? And then they can reset their password that way. Okay. So in the chapter, it touches on what is a one-time password, right? What is a time-based one-time password? Okay. Any questions? So, Eduardo asks, "Can you trick someone? Can you can you fake a facial recognition?" Right. I've seen a system that's not good that you can hold up a picture, and so in facial recognition, what it does is it's gonna pinpoint a few things and it creates a mathematical value of your face. Okay, how wide your cheeks are, how wide are your eyebrows, how far is the top of your head to the bottom of your forehead, right? How far is the top of your face to the to your chin? So it's highlighting all of these points and it creates a calculation and it makes a value of your face, okay? The computer, the system, the facial recognition system would then compare that to a template. So you have to generate, you guys use biometrics on your smartphone, you see this already, right? You've got to scan your fingerprint five times in order for it to really create that template, right? So it creates a template of that person's face by scanning it multiple times, right? Smiling, not smiling, and so on, right? So you want to have variation in this template in the case if, what if I show up one day and my eye got a bruise or something, right? Is it going to recognize me? So the way that they design it is it's creating the calculation based on some of the things that won't change, right? Your chin, you're not going to have a longer chin a month from now. Right, very rare, or you you know, so even when people grow out their hair or change some of the things or wear different makeup, some of the main points like their nose, right? How far is that from the, the left and the right side of the cheek? So that type of algorithm is implemented. Just like your fingerprint. Sometimes people work with chemical and it wears it down. So what you would normally do is when you template fingerprint, you would template it with different fingers and different hands. So in the case that they, they hurt their hand, they can scan with another hand, okay? And you would do at least five templates. So that's how you really be able to do that. So can someone fake that? Depending on how good or bad is the system, sometimes it look at the picture and it seems that it's a person, but the newer system, it actually looks for vital signs, right? It actually see that it is a live person instead of a picture, okay? And they, you know, the programmers, the developer, the creator of the system, they, they, they implemented these things, these elements to make sure. So biometrics has gone a long way, okay? Other questions? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna come back to the notes a little bit. So here it talks a little bit about biometrics. So the things that you should look for, right? Going back to Eduardo's question is, the false acceptance rate, how correct is it when it identifies a fake person, right? If you show up as me and you, you know, put on a wig and you acted like that person, is it going to be able to differentiate? So when it's falsely accepting, that means that it's incorrectly identified the unauthorized person. But when it's falsely rejecting, it's rejecting the real person. So when you show up and you scan and it's not letting you access, but you are you, right? That's false rejection, okay? So those are some of the things that you look for, right? And all of these systems, they'll tell you the percentage, how, you know, how accurate is it? 
because they have done the baseline testing and it will show you like, you know, it's 90 something percent accurate and this is the rate. Okay, so the factors are listed there, okay? Now, um, the issues with using password, we all know, right? We have to use longer password because somebody can brute force your password. Brute force is tried and true, right? They keep plugging in different values for your password, or they can use a list of commonly used passwords or a dictionary list. So your name can be in the dictionary and it's in different languages. So passwords have a lot of problem, but I think that it's gonna take us a long time to completely move away from passwords because we're so innate and ingrained into using this. Okay, so when you create a password, it has what's called the password vault, okay? Does and, Microsoft have its uh, yeah. password with sign in? Yes. Okay. So now you can use password vault. I do use it sometimes. I'm a little bit concerned about how you trust the system, right? Um, you can have a third party that stores this. So what that is, is it's a single source that's gonna keep all your passwords for everything, right? And so what that does is it stores it as an encrypted format. So that way, you know, when you're logging on to your tablet, it's able to, or you're visiting the same website on your tablet that's different than your PC, it should be able to do that. So, um, you know, most of the companies, like if you use, I use Samsung, so, Samsung has Samsung Pass, right? Google has their own, Microsoft has their own. Sometimes it's free with the service that you're using. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit for the type of service, but originally, you know, you do see some of this. So what that is, is you are trusting the entity and what it's gonna do, is gonna create your credential information after you enter the password the first time. It's, it stores the encrypted file right, that, that hash function is there. And whatever that you're accessing, it's just gonna reissue your credential using that stored information. So what happens if your phone is stolen or you no longer have that device, right? It's your responsibility and this isn't their agreement that you would be able to remove account, update accounts accordingly. So is it a full, fully 100% foolproof? Nothing is foolproof. Right, encryption can be broken if you have the resources and the time. Or if you, you know, if something can happen to your device, somebody can breach your device and be able to, you know, and also fashion hijack. There are a lot of different things that could go wrong. Okay. All right. So if Charles is using a fingerprint recognition system and he logs into his laptop that matches one out of four tracks right? He has rejected three out of four tries. What is the efficacy rate for this system? So how accurate is it, right? So when it accepts him one out of four, that's 25%. If I was him, right, I would not use that type of login anymore because if the frustration behind that, right, four times you log in, you can only access one time. So this is important when you start implementing solutions, you say, oh, let's go with biometrics, right? But the user is having this problem, so you would know that your, your, your system is having accuracy issues. Your false rejection rate, for his false rejection rate, it's rejecting him three out of four times, 75% of the time, right? So if you, you know, if I was this user, I would be very upset, right? So not all solutions are the best solution. So when we look at this, we would say, okay, our biometrics recognition system needs upgrade or that type of laptop, right? Maybe perhaps we would buy a separate uh, biometric system to be able to implement the solution. <clears throat> okay, question. I encourage you to read the book and take the practice questions at the end or the review questions at the end of the chapter, okay? If you buy the Kindle version of this book, it's only $17, I bought it, okay? So you can get it for very cheap. 
this class is taught online, I think also RCC this semester, right? Um, and Cengage charge a lot for if you're using the online lab, so. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions before we start talking about uh, KBA? So authentication is a, a foundation to a lot of things. So if, if, you know, if you don't have the proper access, right, everything else kind of, you know, falters. Okay, so in question six, it asks you, when should the organization use static and dynamic knowledge base authentication? And when you're using static KBA, this is used to identify when the user forgets the password, right? You ever reset your password and it asks you, you know, the security question that you put in when you sign up for the, for, for the account. Is it good? Is it bad? Well, security questions have to be stored in a database somewhere. And then when you click reset password, it's gonna prompt you, you know, enter your account number, enter your zip code or your date of birth and then it's going to give you like a couple of questions and it needs to match right so they're saying that those questions needs to be stored somewhere and somebody can hack that database and access all the security questions they can also do session hijack there's a lot of different things can go wrong in the authentication if they really want to go after someone right it's possible if you have resource and time okay that's possible in anything so static KBA is different than dynamic KBA because, right, the first one when you reset, right, it's going to go to that set of questions or that those things that you, you specified at the beginning. The dynamic KBA, it would identify the user without the account. This is more high risk and it's usually like multiple choice questions. It would be like, where did you live? in the last, I don't know, five years. And what the, it does is it's gonna look up your general information, how you fill out some of these things or who you are in general. So dynamic KBA is a little bit more high risk compared to the static KBA. So most companies that implement the static KBA. That's knowledge base, only you, you would know that. That's right, that's distinguish you from another. Can someone know that? Yeah, if they're close enough, they would know which high school you go to, what's your mother's maiden name, you know, what's your, who's your best friend when you were growing up. So, so those types of security questions are kind of, you know, they're pretty generic and we all know what they are. Okay. Yeah, you can go to their social media and you would know, right? Yeah. They would post a picture of their best friend and their name and there you go. Okay. So how do you, how can you control some of the passwords, okay? You can implement what's called the password policy and you don't have to put verbatim. I'm not gonna knock your points down and I will update your grades this week. So you can control how the user create and use their password. Make sure that it's complex. Eight character is by standard, even though regulation requires only certain, like for example, if you're using credit card, they only require a minimum of seven characters, right? But most companies implemented eight because that's the standard across. Some, some requirement like HIPAA requires 12 characters. So as you, you know, because we're forcing five character password takes less than, less than a minute. But when you're forcing seven character password, that takes a little longer. So the longer the password, the longer it's gonna take them to break it, to, to get it, right? So that's the whole point is to buy time. So we also should implement your account policy, which also requires you to configure, they cannot reuse their old passwords. They cannot, they, you know, they can, we can also do lockout policy. So. When you're implementing policy, what does it really look, look like? Okay, I'm gonna show you. We'll, we're gonna do something with it and then in the next one.
Okay. So I'm going to show you how you can access your system local policy and on the server you can also configure policy. So phishing attack, I will save it for in the next couple of weeks we'll talk about different form of attacks soon we'll talk about threats and attack i'll save it for then. but phishing attack is best being deterred by teaching the people how not to fall for it okay all right so sorry i'm gonna swap screen real quick okay so to configure your policy you can practice this at home too right um is you can, everything is searchable in most all new OS. You can search for security policy like this and you will find your local security policy. So when it says local, it means it's for that computer, okay? And when you open it up, it looks like this. This is the security policy console. Your account policy is at the top left. <coughs> And you will find password policy here. Okay. So let's take a look at it. <coughs> Sorry. Any questions? So if you need to set this, you simply click it, right click. And <coughs> sorry, I'm just screaming. Um, you can change this by right click and go to properties and change. So lock out, we can make them lock out for an hour, 24 hours, but it's in minutes here for Microsoft. Okay, so normally we wait 30 minutes, 60 minutes to reset. The threshold invalid login. So if they try five fail password, we can set it to five and that's how you lock them out. Okay. Now most credit card company or banks, they normally lock out for 24 hours business. They do that. It gives you time to contact them, right? And then by that time, they can take a look at the logs, okay? So how did I get here? I searched for security policy in Windows 10. I open it up and account policy is on the top left. You can go in and you can also enforce password history. So if you don't want them to reuse the password for five times, you can set it to five or three times or 10 times, right? Most companies go with five, so they have to come up with new passwords, right? Cannot reuse their password. You can make it for the password to be used for how many days, and here it says 42, but some company would let you use the, your password for longer or less, right? So you can go in and set all of this, and on the server, it's gonna look similar to this. Okay, so but on the server, we would create a template and then we would set it for different groups. Okay, some groups are more stringent than other. And then we would apply that across the entire network. So it's a lot more streamlined compared to just individually set it up for the user. You always want to set up for the larger container. Okay, so now you know how to do this. Okay, you gotta, if you wanted the password to be complex, you just enable that, okay? You can also make them make it longer, 
right? We can put eight character, for example. We can also make it where um, the length needs to be audited. So here it shows that it's not defined, right? On the system, they didn't define this. So as the system administrator, you have privilege to, to control this, okay? So one of my former students that took this class a couple of years ago, this is what he does all day now at the company that he works for. He just emailed me today because I asked him to present at one of the things that I'm attending. And, um, you know, he, he does, he just manages account all day. So this could be part of your responsibility. Can you add a requirement to, um, to require uh, special characters as well? Yeah, so you can, you just enable complex. Complexity requirement, just enable it, okay? All right, so you saw how account lockout threshold policy. So the question eight asks you, Mario is locked out from his account for 24 hours after five unsuccessful authentication attempts. We do this to prevent brute force. Account lockout is used to prevent people from trying your password many times. And that's group forcing. Account lockout duration is the 24 hours, the time that you wait. Okay. So most no people would what? Come call and say, you know, my, my account is locked out. Can you reset it? So as a support technician, you can go in and reset it for them right away. But if they don't call for reset, they just wait 24 hours. To your money. <laughs> yeah, but maybe it's not that important, right? So we can prevent people from attempting or not prevent, but I want to say we slow them down. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So in that case, account lockout helps. Question nine says Alma purchased a new Linksys wireless router for her home. The default user account is administrator and the password is admin. And that's true, right? Out of the box, it's usually administrator and admin for Cisco technology and Cisco owned with Sys. What should Alma do to increase access security to her wireless router? There are a lot of things that she can do, but the first thing I would do is to change right, to connect it and change the admin account. Because the admin can modify the configuration on that wireless router, okay? So we would change the default username and password, anything default you wanna modify. Most people don't do that. They right. don't set up their own routers. And then what Just if you, you create a user account and then you forget, right? What if now you're locked out of your own router and you can't reconfigure it? Well, you can reset it, right? There's a reset button. Most of us see that there's, you can hold it down or, or use the little pencil and, or the pen and press it for a few seconds and it resets. So if you set it back to the manufacturer setting, then you're back to admin, admin again, okay? Now, if you don't change that, what will happen is if they figure out, it's really quick for me to see which, what router that is, right? Okay. I can scan it for the name. I can dig a little bit into it. I can use some of the tools to really tell me what model that is. And then what I will do is I will try, first thing I'm gonna try is your, your default password, okay? And it's simply that, that's gonna take you into your network. Okay? I can take you out that way. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the default password. Okay. Yeah, and there's websites online that you can get all the the, the default yeah. admins for right. different different company routers. That are, yeah, people yeah. put together a list. A list is shared, right? There's it's public. Yeah, yeah, it's every everything is available either on the regular web or on the dark web. So you know your data is cost less than three dollars a piece on the dark web i heard it's three. like a dollar something now it used to be three bucks a few years <laughs> data is cheaper and cheaper right so when we say that that's your social security number all of that all the essential information people 
you know, whenever you have breaches like T-Mobile and some of the cases, yeah, I was I was one of the account that was jeopardized with T-Mobile, and after that incident, I started having a lot of issues with my other accounts. Um, so, you know, but things happen that you know they're are they going to compensate you? Probably not, right? They give you like a free anti-malware thing, and you're supposed to use it and credit check and all of that. So, what are we really doing to really help in, increase? right the security especially with the credential area that will for your end user and the book specified this make sure we know this if your end user are you and me everybody okay make sure that they don't uh, they're not allowed all the things more than what they have we want to use password and lockout policy your administrator they need to use multi-factor authentication, okay? And then there's a service account. You guys know what the service account look like? If you if you ever see like a system account, okay, I'm gonna show you one second. Uh, I'm gonna pause there real quick. Hold on, let's switch real quick, okay? All right, so when you right click a folder and you go to the properties of that folder, so how did I get here? I just choose the folder and then I right click and I choose property. This is the property of that folder, right? So you got, this is me, I'm, I'm on ABC just like, MVC just like you on that system. There's the system administrator, right? How can I tell it's a system administrator compared to a network administrator account? It's this path right here. This is a computer name and then the user account. But if it's a network administrator, it will list also the domain or the network that you're on, okay? Now the system right here, this comes equipped with Microsoft, with Microsoft OS. This is used by the system. So when you open up the file, when you move things, when you delete the files, it takes care of it for you, okay? And, so, and this is only one aspect of it, right? Other service account could be system to system. So whenever I, I can have the system to automatically run the updates and it contact another system. So I would create an account for one server to do that to another server, just like how I would be treating that account with the human, okay? So that's called considered a service account. And you do see some of the service account or your system account being in the back and it has high privilege, okay? And, and in this case, it has high permission. You click on it, you see full control. Because if you don't give it full control, how is it gonna be able to, to, to do things when you tell it to do things, right? As a user. So now can someone take advantage of this? They definitely can, right? So it's there, that's a flaw in the design that we implemented because we, you know, and then eventually we realized, oh, that's broken, let's fix it. So this is the field, right? The field that we're in is that to go back and fix some of the things and fix the current thing that we're facing. All right, so any question with that? <laughs> okay, so now can you, you, what you should do with the guest account is to make sure that number one, they have very limited access. So for example, when you have temporary worker or visitor to your business, so when I say visitor, it could be like auditor, um, people who are there for like maybe a day or a few hours, you turn on that guest account. Some company, they use guest account for people, like people who, who come to the hotel to stay or at the hospital to visit. Um, 
but what you should do, what you should do is you may should make it either temporary or very limited. They don't have access to everything, right? Or much. The administrator account should your administrator, that's what I meant, is the name administrator account should be disabled. You, if you do use an administrator account, it needs to be named something else. Administrator is, you know, if I figure out you have an administrator account, I can put post that account. Once I'm in that account, right, I can have access to everything. So we should disable the administrator account. <clears throat> And if you are an administrator, you should do all your normal activity as a regular user, okay? Only when you're servicing or configuring is when you're on as administrator, but use another username. Okay, any question with account management? So all of that is stated in your notes, okay? So you can find some information there. I modified this since I last taught it. So ask security class certification change. Okay, so for number 12, your PAM, privilege access management. This is useful in limiting time and privileges. So you should limit the time and the privileges of the highest level user. Who are those? Your root user in Linux and your administrator in Windows. This is to prevent escalation of privileges for the unknown user. And when we say unknown, it could be attacker, right? But it could be some outside of what we manage. So what we should do is we should put an expiration on the account that has the highest privilege. So for example, you can enable that account to service your system for a certain time and then we can disable it. We don't delete account because the account is tied to their profile and their files. If they encrypt something, right, administrator can go in and decrypt, but in the case where we need to go and access their files, after they got fired or leave the company, we can't. If you delete the account, it's no longer there. So in the case that if they've been long gone and we don't need that account anymore, we would remove it. But when you know when you can disable the account for a while and then eventually remove it. Okay. So limit time and privileges. So how can you control the account? The same way that you looked at account policy earlier. Right, you can go in and, and create an expiration for that account. Let me show you that real quick. So here in um, in computer management console for the system, you would see the local user. So let's say that I want to modify this account, which is MVC. I right click and I go to properties. Okay. This you can make the password expires by unchecking this. You can disable the account by checking this. That's how you turn that account off, okay? When it's not in use, turn it off, okay? So if you have a thousand user and if you only have 900 active users or a thousand account and 900 active users, you need to go in and audit the other 100 because somebody can use one of your, you know, quiet, silent account and then escalate privilege to be hired because they can change their, their group membership by going here, okay? All right, so if the account is locked out, this is check, okay? So you can nest them, you can put them into different groups and then that will allow you to have different privileges. So privileges are system rights and then permissions are for files and folder. Okay, that's how you do that. Question. All right. So, um, for 13, why should your administrator use 
and use your account regularly for the daily work. We talked about to reduce the risk for unauthorized user accessing administrator accounts. So we would know that we, so in the case where if they access an administrator account, they can access a lot of the resources on, on that system or on the network. And the attack that they would attempt is called the escalation attack. Okay. So they would start looking into what is this administrator in charge of, what do we need to configure, what do we need to change. And then it will escalate from the system to the network, to the infrastructure, to other areas. And then we talked about disabling the account and how to do that on the Windows system. What type of account should be disabled? Your guest account, the people who are no longer working with your company, and also people who are temporarily on leave. And even if you have someone to replace them, that, that replacement person needs to have their own account. So don't share account. Even though they might say, oh, I need to access this account to get this file and this file, right? So you would come back to the IT side, you would have the one of the technicians in charge of pulling some of the files, but they have to make individual requests because if you give them access to another account, right, they can do a lot more, they can delete files, they can do things, and so we can't, we can't establish trust that way. So we wanted to control the resources a little bit more. So they just gonna have enough just to perform their job. If they want a little bit more, they will have to request. So security, a lot of this is to really understand some of the things like this. And then you would, once you understand that, the configuration part is really easy, okay? Just to know how to get in and modify it. So you always think about what could go wrong, what could happen, and you want to prevent that from happening. Questions with these? All right, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. So when we audit the account, what does audit really mean is if we go back and review the account, right? Just like how like tax audit, they go back and look at your tax. When we audit the account, we go back and look at the logs, right? Where it generates a timestamp, the time that the account is accessing a certain resource. Or we can also look at, you know, what kind of things that this account is affiliated with. Okay, so audit really is looking at the permissions, what files and folder and drive, privileges, what kind of resources, you know, access to certain applications, network, etc. to make sure that it's least privileged. And Microsoft has a mechanism where you can go in and set up a policy to and when we say policy, those are just rules, right? Restrictions to how certain things are. You can, you can use that to audit account. Question? So when we say privilege creeping, that means that, you know, they eventually going from, you know, gradually getting a little bit more, more privilege each time or having more than what they, 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 they should have. So, so how can we protect the credential inside the system? Microsoft uses what's called Kerberos and Kerberos come up on a lot of different security certification. <clears throat> it's one of the better technology to really manage authentication. So Kerberos is the way that we would trust authentication in a network using a role of a server called Active Directory. Okay, so we will see, we will do, maybe next week we'll use AD. 
where we would be able to control how the user authenticates. And so Active Directory is, it contains user account group system, right? And the appropriate um, resources that's affiliated with those objects. So when you authenticate, when you have, when we say, when we access, what it is is you have a subject, which is your user, acting on an object, which is a system or a file, okay? And all you have to do is manage that. So Kerberos would then be used within your Windows server environment. And in some cases, your Unix, which is older, right, using ROMs. And it uses what's called a key distribution center for granting the packages. So it's like this. My analogy for this is like when let's say that you you are in your you're visiting an amusement park right and in order to access the resources at this land for example because you have a vip pass you have to validate your vip pass in order to access different resources okay but first you have to be granted a vip pass so in the system it uses what's called a kdc or a, a, a key distribution center, it uses this key to validate that a specific subject or user is able to access certain resources on the network. Okay, so let me scroll down a little more. Okay, so this is another way that we would control through the ticket, the, the key distribution where it would grant a ticket. Like how I would get a VIP ticket. Once I validate my VIP ticket, then it's gonna open the door for me to access the amusement park. But when I need to access VIP resources, I still have to scan that ticket, right? So it is the same concept in that it needs to grant the key and the ticket in order to validate the appropriate resources for that user with that credential. Okay, so when you implement level base like this, you when you are layering it, it, it enhances the security versus where, oh, just give them a password to have access to everything, that won't be good. Okay, single sign-on is very common. You need to know what SSL is. You guys use that here, right? When you once you log into your student account at RCPD. You validate it with your text message. Then it lets you log into Canvas, email, I don't know, student profile or student portal, uh, et cetera. So what they do is they use the authentication API and they, in a, they incorporate that. So it just takes your credential and it passes through different application and different systems. Is it beneficial? Sure. It's easy to use. People don't have to remember like 500 different passwords. It streamlined the authentication process. It does save some money eventually. The drawback of this is that the, your credential can, somebody can get a hold of your credential and they can impersonate you, right? I just need to log in as you as once or if I have your phone, Right, it's already logged in to like 500 different things. I can access your email, your applications, your financial information, and so on. So if it falls into the wrong hand, it can be. So we need to, if we do implement SSO, we have to think about how the reporting process and, and how, what we're controlling, looking at how we manage, you know, monitoring the resources a little bit closer. But it's definitely easier on the user. Not for this, just this certification, you're going to see it for a lot of security certification. It's always going to ask you about access management, least privilege, right? Those things are some of the keys that you need to know. Okay, the purpose of least privilege, only allow the user what they need to do, okay? So if you're a student, right, they should give you only access to student resources, right? 
certain application that you need for class, and that's it. This is going to reduce the risk for the rest of our network and our system. This is harder to implement for most part, you know that. So when we do audit, when we look at the list of employees and what they're supposed to do, right, we map that to application systems and resources on the network. So you would have a table of all your users and, and correlated groups and then the system, and then you would match it up, okay? So when we go back and look, right, so-and-so is a manager, and sometimes people do multiple roles and that can get a little bit weird. It's a little harder to manage. Or you have a manager from one department that also takes care of the other department. And so you would need to take a look at the resources into the other department and map it back to this user. Okay. Very tedious, but somebody gets paid to do that, right? Then your OS, what can, how can you grant permissions to objects under the need to know basis? First, you add the user, okay? Then you create a user and then you will add that user to the object. And we can simply do that right now. Let's pause there for a second. I wanted to show you how to do that. So let's do number 20 together so you know how. Okay, right click your Windows button and go to computer management. So I simply right click the Windows button and then go to management. Computer management is there. So this would show up and then I'm gonna go to local users. Okay. And then users, then I want you to make a new user. So let's say I'm gonna call myself. And then I can create the account. And then close. So once you close it, it's there. So the first thing you have to understand this process, the reason why I'm showing you this is users don't exist. You have to make a user and then you will tie that user to the object now. Okay. Then next, what we're gonna do is we are going to, let's say that I have a folder new folder and then let's say this is we can call the school or something like that okay this is an object that exists in the system and this could be on the network anywhere so you would right click go to the property sheet and that's what the answer means okay now notice that on this property it tells you what kind of folder it is what's the size of that folder the sharing tab allows the user to share it with other people by controlling the sharing permission. I can add people to my share. That's different than the permission for that object. So if you click on the security tab, this is where you add the user, okay? So if you make a folder, let's say, you know, uh, sales for the sales department and you put a bunch of spreadsheet in there for them, what you can do is you can go into the property of that folder and you would add the group of people, the sales group, right? Or the manager group or the individual account, okay? So let's say you have an auditor that looked at the sales to look at the financial status of the company. Then you can click edit here and this is where you add the users, okay? So how did I do that? I click edit, I click add, and then I find myself. The user account that you made, you can click check name, right? 
and then if it can't find it, it will it will look for it again because I already added myself. It won't find it again. Only one instance. Okay. So let's say if I add um, another account. Okay. I can look for that. Okay. So once you once you have that user account added, you just give them the permission. So the permissions are listed here. So you can choose different allow what you allow them to do. Now, Microsoft has a rule that whenever you deny them and it encompasses what's allowed, the deny takes over. So for example, I deny them from, I allow them to modify, but I deny them to read. In order to modify, you have to see, okay? So when you have conflict and permission like this, there's complication, right? People are gonna complain, oh, I can't, I can't edit that file because I can't even see it. Then you already know that, oh, you, you deny them from read and then you need to allow them to see in order to modify. So there gotta be a logical process in that. So you have to think about what is the logical process in controlling the, this resource? Question. So that's the answer for 20, okay? And I want you to know the steps. And so when they ask you a question like this for interview, how do you modify permission for a file? You simply said, right click the file, go to property, right click edit on the security tab. And then, you know, you can click on that user. If that user is not there, add the user and modify the permission. So it should come naturally. Once you do it well enough, you should start knowing in your mind exactly what that looks like. And that's when you, you know, you're comfortable doing this. Okay, 21. What should we do to manage the account to reduce risk? So if you have an account that for a person and that person is has gone on medical leave, the stay home account. We talked about that. Even for a week or days. Okay. Because someone can go in and impersonate her. Internal threat is a lot harder to detect than external threat. It's harder to identify your internal employee who, who's committing fraud compared to the outside. And 80% of the people use their existing work to leverage the next job. Meaning that they will take the sales spreadsheet, right? Account information, client, stuff like that. 80% okay, studies have shown. So, all right. Who can do this recover the delete the account? So let's say you that you delete the account and you find out that you need to recover it for court reasons or you need certain files from that account. The system administrator, the domain administrator, the enterprise administrator can do that. Okay, we're almost done. And then, you know, twenty three. So, what are some of the example on how you can model your assets? So they have set up these models, and this is what the industry follows. There will be rule based. So, so far we talked about like, you know, manager, student user, right? Based on the rule the function that you offer that you that you operate in that company or that institution so that's role based it's very common that's a, that's a very common model you see that everywhere you, they create a group and that group represents the function of their roles in the company or many groups okay. rule based access control you use this already right if you set rules on your wireless router at home to block or if you do parental control on the wireless router or on your devices, that's rule-based. Rule-based can be specific to the service, 
or the protocol or the connection. So you simply set the criteria based on the rule. For example, um, the network only accept traffic from this particular source, or it can only allow, you know, HTTPS, but not HTTP, right? Secure website, but not non-secure website. So those are the rules. And firewall is really good at doing this. Intrusion detection is really good at doing this. Discretionary access control. What do you think discretionary means? If you own it, you have the discretion to give that permission to someone else, right? So you let the entity control a lot of the time, it will be the creator owner, the people who create those objects. And discretionary, the DAC system is not always implemented. Even if you want to implement it, some OS doesn't have that capability, so you can't, right? Most OS would have the role in the rule base. That's common. But discretionary, sometimes, or mandatory or attribute based, some OS don't have that capability. So discretionary just means that if you have, if you own that object, you have the discretion to do to control however you want that access. Just like how you own your, your car, right? You will allow whoever to drive it. Mandatory access control, the government used this, our government, I should say, the military, right? Top secret would require top secret clearance. And then eventually you can classify information as public that will be uh, you know, available publicly. So things like private, public, top clearance, you know, different level of clearances is in the mandatory access control. So you are mandated to meet the requirement in order to access it. So if you don't have top clearance, you cannot access it, right? Attribute-based access control. This is a software design uh, defined network rules usually. So you can specify like how you allow the user to access websites, servers, things like that. So it's really, attributes really mean characteristics. So it's gonna determine based on the characteristics of that website, of that system, of, of that, you know, comparing to the user criteria. It's a little bit different compared to the other ones. So make sure we know these. All right, any questions? Okay, so save your work. I think I gave you a flash drive before. If you forgot it, email yourself, upload it onto your, your OneDrive or your, your Google Doc, so you have it. You, can, you should submit it now if you're finished, if not, Please feel free to, to submit it on Sunday. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Can you scroll up to the next one? Sorry, I'm down. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh huh. Yeah. You missed something. I didn't see the other one. Other questions? Yeah. And sorry, I try to work on your, your VM. It would be easy if just, you know. I made the VM, it takes me like five minutes. Because once you do it once, it's really easy. So we are, I download it. That takes like another five minutes. But maybe I'll, I'll switch to VMware player. All of these things, free products, sometimes it has issues. So um, I'll find a better way to just distribute virtual machine or, you know, because I want you to use it. Because when you restart your computer, it wipes everything. So we will work on the lab next week, okay? Because I think I put it down to the extension for 27, I might extend it. Um, I think my plan is on Monday, we're probably just gonna do all hands-on and then, um, you know, catching up on Wednesday, then 
if we have time, we'll move into chapter three or the next chapter. This book is short anyways. It doesn't have that many chapters. It's 11. So we should have some, some leeway. Questions? All right. Yeah, the quiz, it, if, even if you take it late, it's not gonna penalize you to take the practice quiz. The next one, we'll do a review game with the practice quiz. All right. Uh, yeah, that will be a fight. Okay, save your work, submit it. And then uh, I think that's all I have for, but make sure we read the chapter. If you don't have the book, just read the note, okay? I try to put, it takes me time to edit the notes and put it there for you. So you can you use it as a review source. Use this as a review source. I'm pretty lenient. I give you the answer for some is because I want you to go over with me. If you have questions, please ask me. But you need to, to help yourself in learning this is to read, to practice, to take the practice quiz, to go back, look at your questions and be able to come up with the answer. And, and that's the point, right? Okay. All right. Have a good day. Make sure we unplug the drive, return it. You can bring it up here. Uh, there's Oreos and chips and they're brand new. I just opened them. So, um, and then I will see you here on Monday. Have a good weekend. We'll do some, we'll, we'll do some hands-on. Promise. Thank you, Professor. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Bye. Yes. Okay. Then you can, when you come on Wednesday, or I can loan you the drive to work on it. Okay. Yep. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Well, I tried to, I tried to catch up with lab one, but it was still having error issues using mm. the drive. So I got to figure out, you know, either it's a version of the, their software or, you know, maybe we'll, I'll fix it. Okay. okay, don't worry about that. Have a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.